Greetings, and welcome to today's episode of Wellness Wednesday. I am Dr. Catherine Y. Brown, your host. I'm excited to introduce you to today's guest, none other than Dr. Keith Norman. Welcome, Dr. Norman. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it is truly an honor for you to take time out of your busy schedule. So yay. <laughs> um, for our viewers around the world, can you share a little bit about your background for people who are saying, who is Dr. Keith Norman? Well, sure. Uh, I'm bivocational. I am the senior pastor of a large congregation here in the city of Memphis, Tennessee, First Baptist Church at Broad Avenue. And I'm also the vice president of government relations and chief community relations officer for Baptist Memorial Healthcare, which is probably the role that we're going to talk the most about today. <laughs> Absolutely. So as it relates to COVID-19, I'm actually curious as to what that looked like from both of your lenses, because it seems that both lenses would be, have a voice in the COVID-19 pandemic. So what did that look like? And I'm going to leave that question wide open to whatever sure. way you want to take it. Sure. Well, on the hospital side, uh, as you may be aware, our hospital was the first hospital in Shelby County to treat a COVID-19 patient. I actually was on duty in my role as government relations vice president to make sure that the test, uh, that the sample got tested and it was sent off to Nashville and I advocated to get it done quickly. It was turned around and our hospital system went into action to really lead in this pandemic and to make sure that people were aware of the safety precautions that needed to be taken and how to get treatment as soon as they knew they had come into contact with someone who may or may not have contracted the virus but thought that they had been in the presence of someone. On the other side, uh, as a pastor, I immediately went back to my congregation on the day of and shared with them that we had a, a virus that had traveled across the world right here in our community. And that virus was going to have a major impact. I remember saying on that day that I expected that we this was our last service and that we could possibly be out for an entire year. Well, when I said a year, people looked at me and they said, yeah, he's, he's lost his mind. This won't happen. We won't be out for a year. We were out for two years. Uh, so it really did have an impact. And the hospital side, back and forth, I was continuously advocating for information and making sure that that information uh, from the federal government, from the healthcare systems, was disseminated into the community. As a community relations officer, one of my chief roles is to make sure that people's health is protected, and information is the best way to do that. What we would do was get the information and do public service announcements. Uh, we led the way in having doctors from our system. Dr. Stephen Threckle was one of the lead voices who continued to give daily updates, uh, press conferences, and so forth. And I wanted to make sure that people of color received this information because, as you may well know, the health disparities that often permeate the African-American community and communities of color they were being impacted hardest because the comorbidities that are associated with those communities, uh, COVID-19 had a devastating impact on those individuals. Heart-related issues, blood, re blood pressure-related issues, diabetes, and so many more, which run very high in our communities. People needed to know that the comorbidities were weakening their systems and giving this virus an opportunity uh, to really run rampant and to gain ground quicker than it had to. And this was pre-vaccine. There was no vaccine at that time. And so getting information out and being specific about it. Many times uh, I would take the broadcast time of our church and air specific messages to the African-American community, particularly men, because we saw a devastating impact on men. And then my work transitioned into being an advocate for the vaccine. Uh, we knew that a vaccine was coming from the healthcare side again. And so this is where I'd say God privileged me to serve in the two very vital places at this time. While I was in the healthcare arena, I was hearing information firsthand. And so I could immediately go back to my congregation and broadcast it. We stayed on the air. We did uh, uh, YouTube and all of the various social media platforms. And by doing so, we were getting information out to people quickly. 
I had to quickly become an advocate for the vaccines because there was so much misinformation that actually began at the White House in the previous administration and trickled down to the lowest level and all of the different rumors. And so I went forward. I became an advocate for vaccines after having conducted my own personal studies and also getting good information from my healthcare uh, system, which I have the privilege of being affiliated with, and then sharing it with people uh, as often as I could so that we could get more people vaccinated and get beyond this pandemic. Absolutely. And you, you kind of segue the, the direction I was going to go in. How was your dissemination strategy different than maybe in another community? Because as you said, you had a, a dual lens and particularly in communities of colors, the conversation came with the Tuskegee experiment and all right. these different things came to the forefront where those who were at most risk, right, and vulnerable populations mm -hmm. were very hesitant. I mean, there was a whole wave of males in our community who thought if they got the vaccine, they will become sterile. I mean, you, oh, you've yeah. heard the stories. So how did your dissemination strategy and your knowledge of the community inform the way that you implemented action in an innovative way? Knowledge is powerful and reality must be addressed. Yes. We could not brush off the um, Tuskegee experiment uh, the stories of Henrietta Lacks and all of the things that African-American people have experienced at the hand of health care systems and, and, and medicine in America. We could not brush that off. We had to acknowledge the reality of that. And I also had to educate other populations about how African-Americans feel about those particular things, because there were other people who were shrugging their shoulders. It was hard for me to believe that here in the 21st century, we had medical practitioners who were not well versed on the Tuskegee experiment and not well versed on how Jim Crow uh, impacted how African-American people would or would not receive medical care in America. Um, all of these things were very important. And so before you just go and tell people, hey, here's a vaccine, take it, you have to really address their reality, acknowledge their fears, and validate what is real. And so we had that understanding. We had those conversations. But then I also began to break it down and say some very positive things. Look, the Tuskegee experiment was isolated. The name Tuskegee suggests that it was in a particular space and a particular area. This pandemic is worldwide. There is no way for it to be targeted towards a particular group of people because we've, we have seen the impact on people all over the world and people of various races, creed, and color. And so it was very important to bring that information forward so people would understand it. And also to talk about the vaccine and how the vaccine was not going to change your DNA and not going to impact your reproductive system and not going to, re, uh, not going to hinder your ability to reproduce uh, after your own kind, so to speak. And so it was important to really educate, educate, and trustworthy voices, uh, Dr. Brown, are extremely important. Uh, I went and I found African-American doctors and advocates and key leaders in the community. Uh, we put messaging forward. Uh, I had a group of pastors at one point who all came together and did a message together. Uh, it was very important to galvanize the, the voices of our community in order to save our people. Oh, ab absolutely. And I love the way that you said that. So what has been your greatest success? I hear a lot of successes, but I am very curious from your perspective, if you were to say my number one success throughout this was... You know, I, I think whenever we start to evaluate success, we always have to stop and say, but I could have done more. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are so many things that um, I didn't, I, I would say my greatest success was not really in me, but it was that God didn't let me get tired. Um, it was, this, this was a long and still is a yeah. long journey. Um, and, and some days, you know, I was on calls every day at eight o'clock in the morning, looking at the numbers, hearing about death, worldwide cases, uh, isolated cases in the United States, dealing with government roles where we had governors and mayors who were not 
instituting masking ordinances, um, you know, sending kids back to school somewhat prematurely in some spaces. And all of that can get to be very stressful and weigh heavily on you, especially when you're dealing with it on the front line. Uh, the role of government as it, were, as it related to healthcare and community was pivotal during this time. I operate in, in all of those capacities, government relations and community relations, as well as a pastor. And so my role was, was always, I was always in a meeting and COVID seemed to always be the key. And um, to talk about how resources were not getting to certain places, uh, communities that I'm akin to in many ways and, and I come from. So I think my, my greatest success is that the Lord let me keep my faith and my sanity, and he did that for me, really. He uh, old to be kept is what I would say at this point. And it was it was that because every day I had a resilience and I knew that it was a strength outside of me, greater than me that flowed in me. He, you know, uh, he, he wouldn't let my foot slip. He, he did not slumber. And uh, there were days, I mean, there were moments, I mean, you know, family time was was you couldn't go see your kids. You couldn't see your grandkids. You couldn't see your family. And I was in front of a computer at seven o'clock in the morning every day talking about these things and then making phone calls. How do we get vaccinations out? How do we get testing done? And um, I think through it all, when I look back over it, the fact that I, I did get you know weary at moments, but I didn't quit. That that's it. This is the Lord's uh, it's the Lord's strength that I was leaning on. So didn't, I kept the faith. That, that may be the greatest success. And I didn't do that. God did it for me. I, I love it. I love it. Now, I, I would be remiss if I didn't observe the, the fraternal letters over your shoulder. So did that have... <laughs> yeah. Did, did, was there any work that you did through Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity? So we did. Yeah. Uh, one of the most powerful things that happened during... Um, my uh, Omega period right here in COVID was, first of all, I was very proud of our national president, Dr. David Marion, who continued to stress the importance of testing, the importance of vaccination. And then he would not allow the rules to become lax. And so from the top down, Omega led and persevered in this process. And locally, um, I was very proud of our vice bossless and our, lo our local chapter, Epsilon Phi. We did a, a community Zoom together where we got the men and the brothers together to talk about things like mental health and mm. separation and depression that occurs. Fraternities yeah. are together. You know, brothers like to be together. How yeah. good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together is what we thrive on. But COVID separated us. And we realized that some of the men who were widowers and whose wives, wives may have passed, they, that fellowship was distanced and separated. So Omega was uh, Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated, Epsilon Phi Chapter, was so on point with taking care of the brethren. Antonio Avant Sr. and I worked together. He did a tremendous job in putting that together. Uh, brothers reaching out to brothers. I was proud of that. And I'm still proud of it because we still do it. Oh, I love it. I love it. See, I bet you didn't think we, we, man, we didn't got in Baptist in here. We didn't got, right. hood. We, we didn't got everything. Right. So, you know, considering where we are now today yeah. is August 3rd, 2022. Yeah. Um, we have something new on the rise. Right. Yeah. And so, but where do we go from here? You know, as you think about community, what, what are our next steps? Because there's yet work to be done. Yeah. So as I think about community, several things have to take place. Number one, information systems and communication have to become universal. Um, I discovered a whole lot during the time period that COVID came in just with our school systems. Remember, our schools went virtual immediately. And there were communities that did not have access to high speed internet, to Wi Fi. And those communities, uh, suffered in getting information. Yeah. Kids had tablets, but they didn't have access. Mm -hmm. So that was very important. But that also meant there were parents and grandparents and extended families 
that did not have access. A lot of churches could not go virtual right away. So we have to do more to build our infrastructure. We are in um, the, the, the technology era of life. This is the technology generation. We're going to have to make sure that all people have equitable access to getting information, and then that that information permeates into the lowest rungs of every community so that everybody has an equitable opportunity to survive and to thrive. Uh, we have to fix systems where people get goods and services. Listen, we were delivering food to places. We were making sure that people had food to eat because in some cases there weren't grocery stores adequately staffed and supplied with the right things that they may need in those communities. Healthcare has to be more of a universal aim. We have to not only have health coverage for people, but we have to have access points for people. Uh, we operate a mobile van and we were on demand, even in COVID, going into places to help people get the care that they needed. But we needed 10 of those just to keep up with the demand. And so it's something that we're going to have to most certainly uh, improve. You know, with improvements, I can go on and on and on and on. But I think the number one improvement we can make is the personal uh, attention that we give to our own temple. Uh, why wait for another pandemic to lower your blood pressure? Why wait for a monkeypox vaccine to have to come out um, that you go and continue the hand washing, sanitizing, uh, breathing uh, uh, processes that we learned during COVID? Why wait? to get to a point where your A1C is high and you bring it down. Don't wait for these things to happen and then to respond. Manage them now. What can we do? Eat better, walk in our communities. We're building a park at my church. We, we took it on during COVID. We built a park with a walking trail and green space because oftentimes we tell people, go walk in your community. But let's face it, their communities are not safe. There's gunshots in the communities. There's, you know, stray dogs walking around and people don't want to walk. Now we have a safe, well-lit park across the street from our church, a place of safety and a trusted environment where we're scheduling things for people to get out of church and go walk. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I love it. Well, let me tell you, you have done so much and we are thankful for your service during this time. How can people get in touch with you? Well, you can always reach me at Baptist Memorial Healthcare, uh, keith.norman at bmhcc.org, keith.norman at bmhcc.org. And then you can always reach me at First Baptist Church, Pastor Keith 4 at aol.com. I still have the last AOL address uh, on earth, Pastor Keith Moore at AOL.com. Those are the best ways to really reach me, uh, to send me an email, and then we'll have the proper response system to come forward or someone to be able to help out. Love to be able to serve and connect with people uh, is what God has given me to do. Well, Dr. Keith Norman, this was your first time on Wellness Wednesday with me, and I sure hope that it is not your last. We want to follow up and continue to monitor your work. We're going to put all of your contact information below this so that our viewers around the world can follow your work uh, and just stay connected and in touch with you. Thank so you. thank you again for being here. Thank you so much. And for our viewers around the world, you just met Dr. Keith Norman, who is doing amazing things. He's he's actually a kaleidoscope because if, if you listen to what he said, he's not doing one thing. He's doing multiple things simultaneously and actually making a measurable impact of all of in, in every single way. So uh, you just met a, a, a hero for the day. So until next time, I am your host. Dr. Catherine Y. Brown, please like, share this message with other people in your community. Until next time, have a great day, everyone.